Uh, now it is my pleasure, privilege, and honor to introduce you to our first keynote speaker, Anthony Ian Arino. Please come up, give him a warm welcome. Anthony has been a wonderful friend. He is a smart guy. I would call him a brainiac. And he has written five books, five best-selling books that uh, you should all get on Amazon.com. Take it away, Anthony. Thank, Thank you. you. Good morning. How are you? Listen, I'm a super needy speaker. Just so you know this, I'm going to be talking to you the whole time we go through this. I went to Lhasa, Tibet in 2010. To fly into Lhasa, Tibet, uh, you never descend. You just land at 15,000 feet. And when you get out of the airplane, you realize that you can't get any oxygen into your body at all. And so you start breathing and you try to get this oxygen in and, and you just can't do anything about this. I went and saw my doctor before I went to Lhasa and I said, I'm afraid I'm gonna have altitude sickness. I took this altitude sickness medicine for about a week and then the people that I was with decided we're going to go to Mount Everest and we're going to just go up to base camp one. That's a three day drive through China. So we drove all the way through China and we got to 17,200 feet. We're at base camp and I'm sick. My hands are tingling, my face is tingling, my legs are tingling and I'm with a Sherpa. A Sherpa is not a guide. A Sherpa is somebody who lives in the Himalayas. And he takes people up to base camp all the time. And he looked at me, and it's always good when somebody says something like this. What's wrong with you? Don't you love that when somebody says something like, what's wrong with you? And I said, I'm sick. I, I, my, I'm tingling all over. And he said, are you taking altitude sickness medicine? And I said, yeah. My doctor prescribed it. He said, you're allergic to altitude sickness medicine. Okay, so now I have to tell you a little bit more about this story. I was in the Sherpa's house earlier in that week, and there's no door, and in the first floor there are donkeys and chickens, and there's a little pot belly stove, and then the smoke is coming out through a hole in the ceiling. And the Sherpa and his family took yak dung, and they make it into patties, and they've insulated the whole house inside and outside. So now I'm stuck with and I'm trying to figure out what I'm supposed to do here because I'm talking to a person who didn't go to high school, didn't go to college, doesn't have a medical degree, who's telling me to throw away my altitude sickness medicine that was prescribed by a doctor that went to Ohio State University. And at some point it strikes me, Zimmerman's never been to the Himalayas. Like what could he know? He's a doctor. He lives in Columbus, Ohio. He's 600 feet above sea level. I'm at 17,200, and this guy's here all the time, and he's seen this before. And I decide I'm going to throw away the altitude sickness medicine, and I threw it away. But he wasn't done with me. He said, um, you know what your problem is? I can't wait to hear now, right? And, and he said, you walk too slow. You have to walk a lot faster up here so you get enough air into your body. Now I'm telling you this because I want to share with you an idea that's called one-up. And the idea of being one-up is not one-upmanship. It's not where I'm trying to put you down by saying, Stu, did I meet you at Harvard in, in 96? Were you at that Greek party? Do I remember that? That's me trying to make him feel bad in front of other people. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is the difference between what I know as a salesperson and what the client knows as a buyer. When the internet came out and it started to be adopted, people said there will never be a need for salespeople in the future because you're going to be able to go out and do your own research. Now, they are doing that and they're also suffering from buyer's remorse. But what we have to rely on if we want to create value for clients is we have to rely on information disparity. So information disparity means I know something you don't know. And if I were to teach you what I know about the decision that you need to make, you would get better results because you're getting all my experience of doing this over time. So I'm gonna just zip through these real quickly. I won't even do this, I'll just talk to you. HubSpot did a, a, a survey and they asked people, 
Um, would you rather research on your own or would you rather inter interact with a salesperson as you think about buying something? 71% of them said, I'd rather do it by myself. What does that mean? It means that they don't think that the conversation that we're having with them is interesting enough and helpful enough that they want to engage in that. That's one thing we know for sure. They're 57% through their buyer's journey before they talk to salespeople. And when uh, CEB said this, people went crazy and they thought this is a terrible thing that's happening. What it means is that you have to be there at the 0% mark and start doing something about this sooner because they are doing the research and they are having the conversations without us. And why are they having them without us? Because they don't think that we're gonna be helpful enough for them to waste their time with most of us. I'll leave these up if you wanna take pictures of them. Uh, B2B uh, sales teams, 34% of salespeople think it's getting harder to close deals. And a lot of it's being hard to close deals because they're not really deals in the first place. I have five companies that have now told me we can have a first meeting but we can't have a second meeting. Why can't they have a second meeting? No value in the first. If you can't create value in the first, I'm not giving you a second. So this is where we are. And this is why I think if I were to show you an executive briefing like I just did, I did it as fast as I could because I get short time with you guys today and I want to make sure you get the gist of what I want to share with you. When you show people data like that and you give them an executive briefing, you do two things. The first thing that you do is you prove that you are an authority and an expert because I'm teaching you what's going on in the industry and where our industries come together. So that means I'm immediately an authority and an expert because I'm the one teaching you what's going on. The second thing that you do is you immediately start creating value for your client. And if you wanna win more deals, if you wanna create more opportunities and win them, the most important thing for you to do is to make sure that you create value for that person immediately. Like there's no warming up. So I will tell you, if you do this, if you do what I am saying right now, um, and you wanna just put your head down and sort of hide from this, it's okay. Uh, I, I'm not gonna call on anybody, but I will tell you. If you open up a conversation with a client and you show them uh, a, a slide deck that starts with information about your company, they can get that on the internet. They don't, they don't need you to tell them anything about your company. All they have to do is do a Google search. They're done. And then if you start showing people logos, that's not their logo, you're boring them. They have no interest. They have no interest in seeing who your clients are at this point in the conversation. If you move from that to let me tell you about our products and services and how we help companies like you, well, you're nodding, you're, going, you're disagreeing with this, right? Yeah, he's disagreeing. This is why people don't want to talk to us anymore. This is why. You're boring, you're repetitive. I could take your slide deck and somebody else's slide deck, I could swap them out, you could both talk the same talk tracks the whole way through without missing a beat. So if you do what's called context locking and you actually show people like this is what's going on, now you can move some of their false assumptions, their misconceptions out of the way and then have a different conversation. So this is the game that you need to play. If you wanna be successful in sales right now, it's a game called I know something you don't know, may I share it with you. When you start teaching people what you know, they get better results. I'll just do this, so there's, there's a concept being one up, which is I know something you don't know. And then there's another concept called one down. One down looks like this. You lack the knowledge, you lack the experience, you don't recognize the factors that are gonna cause that client to either do well or to do poorly. If you don't learn from your experiences and you don't start organizing what you know about how clients need to make changes, then you're in trouble. And on the top of the second row here, if, if I had you to highlight any one of them, using the legacy sale approach that most people use is a way to make sure that you lose a lot of deals that you could have won. You have to be one up, your sales force has to be one up. They have to be given insights and perspectives and the experiences that they can share with the client so that the client can make the right decision. 
So this is information disparity. This is the heart of a modern sales approach. It's not about why us. It's not about talking about how good our company is or our product is. Your competitors got a good company, they've got good products too. The contest is not between companies and products. The contest is between salespeople to see who can create the greatest value for the client, build a preference, build the certainty, and then have that person be willing to walk forward with you. If that makes sense, say yes. yes. Yeah, okay, and some of you didn't say yes, so you don't think it makes sense, and just go ahead and show them a picture of your building. If you show them a picture of your building, they're definitely gonna buy. And if you have like a footprint and you show them the footprint, they love that. They're like, look at all those locations that are nowhere near me. This is amazing. I didn't know you guys were far, far away. That's crazy. You just, you just don't need to do any of this anymore. They're ready for you to just walk straight into the conversation. So I'm going to give you a couple just thoughts. The beginning of this is something called a touch point. You know the conversations your client needs to have because you have them every day and they engage in them every five years or seven years or something like that because they want to skip steps, because they want to tell you you don't need to bring in other people on my team, you have to have the wherewithal to say, no, I have to push back and tell you if we don't do this, it's going to harm your results in the future. So that's one of the things that we have to do. I'm going to just try to give you some other things. For a long time, we've talked about questions and stories in sales. And what we want people to do is ask a lot of questions in discovery. One of the challenges when you start asking a lot of questions in uh, discovery, with especially in a first meeting, it makes it look like you don't know what you need to know, but you already do. So I don't need to ask a client what their problem is, and I don't need to ask them what their pain points are. Why not? Because I already know. How could I not know it? I'm an expert and I'm an authority in my industry. I have to ask you what kind of problems are you having and what are the implications? Jim, is it your third day on the job? Like, did you just get here? Like, I have to start training you now about how to think about my business? I gotta go with somebody else who already knows about all these problems and has solved them for a lot of other people. So you have to be careful. And if you wanna ask really good questions, you ask questions that the client doesn't know the answer to because you're trying to transfer your knowledge and experience to that person. So when you, you've done this before, I'll see if you've done this. Have you ever asked a question and the client says, that's a great question? None of you have done that? Okay, some of you, it's like three of you. Oh, you should try this if you haven't done it. If you come to say that, what it means is, you just taught me something about myself that I didn't know, that I need to know now. That's what happens. So if you say something like, what are the three major changes you've made to your strategy going into 2023, and what do you think that's gonna net you out in new revenue? Like, mm, I, I don't know that we have three. I'm not sure what they would be. Now they go, that's a good question. Because you're teaching them something that they need to know to be able to get the results that they want. Now this might not be for everybody in this room, but if you wanna be a trusted advisor, if you wanna be consultative, if you wanna have a team that acts like that and that creates tremendous value, this is where we are. And look, I'm not proud of this and I'm not happy about it. I used to sell at a time where I would sit down with the decision maker, a single entity, one person, and I would slide a piece of paper across the desk of them and they would sign it and we would have a deal without having 17 people in the room with them. I mean, it was a lot better. I hope we go back to that someday, but that's not where we are. You do have to help the client learn something about themselves, including why they're responsible for the root cause of the challenges that they're trying to deal with. And just because I love this so much, I'm gonna share it with you just because I, I'm indulging myself here. This is my favorite thing. It's called triangulation strategy. And I'm post-political, so I, I don't have any politics. And if I did have them, I would give them to you so you could have your politics, because I have no interest. Uh, I find them disappointing. In 1992, Bill Clinton ran for president against uh, Bush and Perot. And he, he met a guy named Dick Morris. And Dick Morris tried to talk him out of something. They were trying to get him in the 92 so that he could win in 96. 
And Dick Morris said, we're just going to go ahead and win now. Here's how we're going to do it. We're going to triangulate both parties. We're going to triangulate them. So this is what he did. He said, when you talk about the Democrats, you're going to say, they are very, very good when it comes to social issues. But they're terrible on crime. And they're terrible on foreign policy. And then when you talk about the Republicans, you're going to say, they're really good with physical policy and we do need to get the budgets under control, but they're way better on crime and these sort of things. So he just said something nice. So he sang the praises first, right? And then he started confessing everybody's sins. And now he's the moral authority above all of this, telling people what they need to do. When you try to differentiate on your company, or you try to differentiate on your product or your services, whatever it is, what you're doing is projecting that you are a commodity. You're com you are actually projecting commodity. I think my company's better than the other guy's company, and I think my product's better than them. They're both good. Either one of them's going to probably work for that client, unless there's something specific or special about that. So what does this look like? It looks like this. There's basically four models. If you want to differentiate in a meaningful way, you don't talk about competitors, you don't start naming people, you act like a business advisor. Because if you want to be consultative, what it means is you're a business advisor. You're not a salesperson. If you start giving people advice and recommendations and you start giving them counsel, you are not a salesperson. You are consulting you're going to tell them what they do to get the best possible results. And you better know what you're talking about. But if you start talking about, there's four different models that we see in our industry, and the one that has that lowest price also has some concessions that you have to make. You can see the concessions here on the thing. So you're going to lose service, you're going to lose customization, you're going to lose the strategic outcomes that you want. If you go all the way to the other end, and maybe that is where you want to play, best in class, higher price, higher value, better results, we'll get your strategic outcomes. The only concession I'm going to ask you to make in that model is pay me more so I can invest more to make sure that you get exactly what you want. I don't know how to say this, and women here will um, correct me. I think it's called Hermes, is that it, the brand? Somebody confirm or deny that for me. Do you know how to say it? Hermes, okay, it's Hermes. Their, their slogan is, it's not expensive, it's expensive to make. That's right. If you want the best that you can get, you got to give me the money so that I can invest it for you and make sure that you get something that's good. Does that make sense? If you want to change the way that you differentiate, you differentiate on models and you say something really nice like, we have a lot of friends that are commodities and scaled commodities and we know a lot of each other. We meet each other at uh, conferences like this, really nice people. We have a lot of friends there. We just hate their model. We just don't think that's a good model, and here's why. You're giving up too much of what you need to actually get the results that you want. And if you would go and invest a little bit more, you would get exactly what you want, and you'd probably have a lower cost structure as well. If this makes sense, say yes. Yes. Okay. This is what it looks like. I did this to figure out where I was taking my wife for dinner on our 27th anniversary. Uh, well, listen, so you might think this is funny, but like a week before our, our uh, anniversary, she said, have we been married 22 years? And I'm like, shouldn't you know that number? Like, I know, it's 27 years. But she, she thought it was 22, so McDonald's it was. Uh, no. Like, I could take her there, but I would expect to get served by lawyers within the next 24 hours after that being our anniversary dinner, right? You could go up to a nicer place like Applebee's where you could watch NFL football on your uh, anniversary dinner. Probably still get you sued. Could go to Smith & Walensky's. It's a good chain. I like it. But Kitchen Social, there was only one of them, and the owners know us. And they always bring us every new thing that they have because they, they like us. And we ate there three times a week through the pandemic. So they, they have a, 
a lot of uh, affinity with us because we spent a lot of time making sure that they didn't go out of business. But this is basically what you're doing is you're figuring out where are you on this and you can triangulate from any spot. So if you're just good enough, you're one back, all you have to do is say, you don't need to pay more, we can get you the same outcomes essentially for less money. But you have to figure out how to have a team talk about this when they're sitting in front of a client. And I'm done. And I, do I still have time? How much time? Okay, so I will take questions if you want, and I will uh, help you in any way I can in the few minutes that I have with you. You're going to ask a question? Sam, <laughs> what happens when you introduce a one-up concept to a risk-averse buyer? You take the risk away. Are you sure? Yes. No, there's, there's a concept here. There's a certainty sequence. What we've gotten wrong, because we've used the legacy approach for so long, is we're trying to create the certainty at the beginning of that. So we show them the, the picture of our building. We show them our clients. We show them it's all just trying to give them certainty. They don't care about any of that at the beginning. At the end, that's nice and useful. So you have to give them first certainty of negative consequences if they don't change. The beginning of that conversation is one that's designed to make them recognize that there is change and it needs to be done if they want the better results that they want. The certainty that you give them later is the certainty of positive outcomes. And that has to happen later. And when you decide to show people those slides, and you can say, the reason I'm showing you this is because these are all the resources we're gonna put against what you need to do right now to make sure that you get this. Certainty right now is the game. When there's instability, when there's uncertainty, when the Fed is, is marching up uh, the, the rates right now, which they're gonna stop, by the way. They'll, they'll stop at about 4.5. Why? Because I know them. I'm on their business advisory council for Cleveland Fed, so I know it stops at 4.5 and it'll be that way for the entire uh, next year. So I don't know that we're gonna have a soft landing, but I have a good sense that we will. The more certainty you can create that the person needs to change, the more certainty you have to create that they're gonna be successful. And that is a one-up position. If you decide that you can do that by telling them your company's a good company, you're a commodity. And, and that's the thing, you have to have a better approach than your competitors. You, it is really your approach versus your competitor's approach. I would argue that you should be one-up your team should be one up. And what I expect from my team is that they have to be the very best people in our industry. Like they have to be the best salespeople in the industry. And that means a lot of development. It means a lot of training. It means a lot of coaching. It means spending a lot of time with them. But once you get them to that position where they know everything that they need to know to create value for the client, your win rates go up. And uh, the only thing that I care about personally is the sales conversation and the effectiveness. And I can tell you the effectiveness by looking at your win rates. You show me a 22% win rate, you're gonna have a tough time. You show me something like 46, you're gonna have a really good time. Go ahead. How many minutes does it take? Do you mind repeating that? Oh, thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Wow, that was magic. How many meetings does it take to win that client? However many it takes. It, however many it takes. I have no idea. I know I have, I have good friends. My friend Victor Antonio, he loves velocity. I could care less about velocity. If you tell me I have to have two more meetings to get a $2 million deal, I'll give them the two meetings. I don't know. Like, wh why, if, if I would speed it up and I leave them behind, then I'm not going to win the deal. I just want to win. I mean, if you get it two days later, are you all right? I am. I, I give people time. Go ahead. How do you pivot from the I want to see a demo request where they sometimes can get impatient for the conversation about the industry or the challenges and things like that? Do they ask you for a demo? <laughs> do they really want a demo? Usually they need to be recentered and reframed around the right challenges rather than getting Here, Here's what I can tell you that I believe and that I know. Uh, I, don't, I don't think that that's really what they want. And I think what they really want is a strategic outcome. 
So I could do that without showing the demo at all and saying like some of the functionalities are designed to make sure that we lower your cost structure. Some of them are aligned to automate some of these processes and this is how we're gonna get you there. I would try to have that conversation. If it's a senior leader, they're, they're never going to. I buy software and uh, when people say, can I show you a demo, I have to tell them, if I have to see it, then I can't buy it because I will never touch it. I, I don't want to. I have, my team has all kinds of software that they use. I don't care about it all. I think if there's an end user, end users sometimes want to see what the functionality looks like and you probably need to say, let's separate these two conversations so I can have this business conversation with you and make sure your team gets the certainty they know, need that they're going to be able to use this software and get these outcomes. I, I'm not a, an ed, a demo guy though, so. Yeah, I'd rather just have a conversation. Hey, Anthony, over here. Um, I'm an enablement, and I, I loved your book, and um, trying to teach our sales team some of these concepts. One of the exercises you mentioned in your book is taking away the product. You're not allowed to talk about the solution and, and all of that. Do you have any other practical advice on how to get a team up and running with this type of methodology? I'll give you my best, my best guess for you. you. You have to start organizing your insights and your perspective and people's experience so that they can share it with each other. So you have to, otherwise they end up not having what they need. So they need the actual talk tracks and the information disparity. You have to help them do that. And I tried to demonstrate that for you in the book with an executive briefing. And whenever I say executive briefing, people think it's something more than it is. I can do it with four slides with data and describe four trends and what impact it has on the client and why I think they should be doing something about it. I can do that in a very short period of time. That exercise though is an interesting one because we started doing it in workshops. You're not allowed to talk about your company, you're not allowed to talk about your product, you're not allowed to talk about your clients, you're not allowed to develop rapport, one more, whatever, remember at the moment. Everything that people tend to do in the sales conversation, I take away from them. I bring up people who have been in the industry for a long time, and they immediately, oh, the pain point, that's what they're not allowed to talk about. They immediately go to the pain point, like, well, what's the problem and what's the pain point? Not allowed to do that, you're disqualified. But when they're young people and they haven't been taught that yet, they can get right past this. They can get right into another conversation. And it's because they haven't done something for as long as we have. So I, I've been using a legacy approach starting in 1992, somewhere in that neighborhood. It's a long time. I used it until 2001. I had a client who couldn't make the decision to pay people more money. And uh, I, I made a 100 slide deck briefing and I bludgeoned them. I bludgeoned them for an hour, like, a, like a, taking a stick and beating them with data until they just relented. Uh, I went through every, the, the slides were repetitive. Like, here's the New York Times telling you about the labor market. Here's the Washington Post. Here's the Wall Street Journal. Same data, just showing it to them from different sources. At the end of it, full bird kernel, HR guy, shocking. He, he said, that's, that's a really good brief you gave us. Can I have a copy of the slides? First time anybody ever asked me for my slides. First time. And so I wasn't sure if I should give it to him. Why do I need it? And he said, I'm going to be briefing the executive committee in two hours. And it would be really nice to have this. And I said, okay, you can have it. He said, take your logo off. And I'm like, this dude stole my homework. Like, I did hours and hours of work and he's just gonna take it like it's his. But I'd already said yes, so I gave it to him. And uh, he called me two hours later and gave me $2 million to raise his whole entire sales for his uh, sports, $2 million. It was a $2 million buy from teaching him what he needed to know. He believed labor was abundant and it was cheap and neither of those things were true. I'm Anthony Anarino. I'll tell you how to find me if you want to. I write a blog every day at thesalesblog.com and uh, I'm going to miss you guys tonight because I'm not going to be able to stay for the rocket launch but have a great time. Learn a lot while you're here. Take three
practical things away from it. Thank you.